Hey, Michael, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. All right. Good morning, Brian. Thanks for having me on, on the podcast. Uh, give you a quick background. So my name is, is, is Mike Curry, and I'm the general manager of desktop printing at Nexa 3D. And uh, I live up here in Boston, you know, a uh, growing family. And I guess my beginnings, I guess I started off my career as, as an engineer. Uh, actually, I was ROTC in the Air Force. And so the first 10 years, I was, I was in the uh, defense industrial complex, if you will, and um, you know, really kind of cut my teeth engineering then. And I kind of like said to myself, okay, I've, I've been in this industry for a long time. Can I cut it commercially? Because when you're in the defense industry, you know, the, the price of a life is priceless. So they give you tons of resources, but you're never really sure like, okay, does this hack it in the real world? Um, so after about 10 years of that, I, I made the switch over to business and jumped in as a, a technical consultant, helping out a sales team. And from there, my, you know, the career just kind of kept on moving and trying new opportunities and um, ultimately landed into uh, sales management. And that's kind of where I'm at now. We're not kind of, but that is where I'm at now uh, with Nexa 3D. And it's been a, it's been a wild ride along the way. Well, how does a guy go from, you know, this great technical education and even a master's degree in MIT from MIT into sales? <laughs> so you, you've, you've done my bio. Great. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, you know, I think it really was this. It really was this idea. Well, first off, MIT has a has a great tradition of, of entrepreneurship and and bringing ideas out of the lab and in, into the commercial space. And I think, you know, uh, I took part in a um, an energy an energy pitch off contest, if you will, when I was a grad student. And so I've always kind of had a bug towards you know a, a commercial outcome. Um, but really, it was this sort of this internal nagging of you know hey could you do this could you put you know yourself out in front of a customer and let the customer vote with their dollars and say like if 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 the product you're bringing is correct and right for the market then they're going to respond with with a sale and have that immediate feedback so I, I think i was kind of craving that actual commercial feedback if 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 i was up to the up to the task and that's kind of how it started and how long did it take before you felt comfortable in sales like it was your thing because it's just the opposite of engineering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it took, I think, quite a bit of time. <laughs> I actually was a little afraid to talk to people, if, if I'm honest, uh, of all walks of life. So, what actually the thing that really helped me? I think I was on the airplane flying over to Asia to start this new job, and I, I you know, read Dale Carnegie, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends, Influence People for the First Time. And he's like, look, you can learn something from everyone, no matter who they are. And I was like, okay, that's it right there. If that's the thing that will get me over any kind of hesitancy to talk to a non-technical person. Um, and I think that was the mindset shift that I needed. Uh, yeah, because you know, you're walking, you're walking in these circles of isolation and, and you're, you, you know, when you're in business, you're talking to everybody and everybody is a potential uh, relationship and a potential door opener for something else. And I think that was, that really helped me make the shift. Um, and then, yeah, so having the mental shift is one thing and then and doing it is the next. So just, you know, kind of diving in and, and uh, I think when I jumped into sales, I also started over overseas in Singapore with, with Oracle. And I think, you know, not only was it just a career shift, it was a life shift and everything was brand new. So you know, there wasn't really anything old that I could hang on to. So I just had to jump in. I think people make that mistake when they first get into sales that they have to do the talking versus the asking. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. You, you, you don't learn anything if you're the one doing all the talking, right? There's no opportunity to, to, to learn something new. So yeah, you have to step back and, and actively listen. And it's really hard. I think active listening is really hard to do you know, because everyone has that voice inside their head of and, and their own curse of knowledge about something. And you have to really kind of check that to, to, to focus on the other person. And was there a pivot point that took you from okay at sales to really good at sales? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd say. Is that I'm happened yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I want to say I'm good at sales. I think <laughs> people who I know listening to this podcast might be like, okay, that might, might be choking. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's more about, uh, you know, you 
sales obviously is like a batting average. You're not going to win everything. So you, you know, it's, it's how well you, you, you respond and adjust you. Everyone's going to get wins and everyone's going to get losses, but it's, it's how you stay in the game, which I think in the long run determines like how well someone success, how, so, how successful someone is and, you know, how they deal with that. Um, but I think, I think a successful career is, is someone who can, who can be consistent and, and hang in there and, and keep on learning from the times when they, when they don't get the win and, and, you know, don't take the win too seriously when they do get it. And then you moved into sales leadership. What was the motivation there? Sure. Uh, I, I think the, the, what I, yeah, I think the thing, which uh, this was probably coming from um, my technical background and kind of like the analytics of when you're in sales leadership, you, you, you have a lot, you know, you have your, metrics that you're trying to address. You have your market you're trying to address. I think it, it felt like I could bring some of those analytical skills to bear in addition, in addition to the, the social skills to bear. Um, and it just felt like that was a sweet spot for me because, you know, I, many times I was looking at new product introduction or, you know, bringing a new, a new sales team to bring a new product to market. So it was never, you know, inheriting something that, that, that was existing. It was like, okay, how do you figure it out? So for me, it always has to have some element of problem solving uh, as well as selling. And that's kind of what, what, you know, drew me to uh, sales management. I would say that, you know, without that problem solving component, I may not have been drawn to us. I've been drawn to those specific instances where that was a big critical ingredient of it. Because that seems to be very consistent among great salespeople. They view it as a puzzle, a problem to solve, or they view it as a competition where it was more like, probably more like the Oracle thing, Oracle against whoever, or HubSpot against whoever. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely the competitive aspect is there too. I think for me, the, the problem solving and hacking the system aspect is there first and then the competitive nature to 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 win comes like right after that. That at least for me and my makeup. And where'd you get that that competitiveness? The military or, um, you know, I maybe it's uh, you know I I I'm not the the world's greatest athlete, um, but I I, I kind of <laughs> see myself. I, I you know I don't know. I think that I've I've I don't know where the juice the drive comes from, but you know I'm not a world-class athlete, but when I'm in an intramural sporting event, I, I always want to do my best. And I always, I always want to win. You know, I, I, I want to, uh, do it. You know, I, I might be on a, a 5k or rowing and I say to myself, okay, Mike, you're not an Olympian, but this is your Olympics right now. And kind of, you know, just push myself to, to, to do as good as I can. And I think that's, uh, that's more of a personal drive. Um, than say like I want to you know, I want to win um, to get the championship, if you will. Yeah, and how about the drive to go from big company to small innovative startup? Yeah, I, I you know I, I, what's what's great about the big companies is that you know starting off they endow you with all kinds of support mechanisms, you know, l you know, learning tools and and development tools and all these accoutrement to, to, to give you a great experience. Um, and so I would always say like, it's great to start in a, in a, in a larger company to kind of get all that training and, and build with all that training. Um, and then at some, and then the point becomes where you're like, okay, there's, there's a lot of resources here, but then it's like, this is a, this is an aircraft carrier, you know, to make any moves within this, you either have to find like a niche within that, or you have to, you know, get really good at, at, playing politics and, 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 and that to me was not as, you know, not as prevalent in like say smaller companies and typically like the smaller companies are also, you know, newer, um, looking to bring that new product to market. And so as I've kind of gone smaller, I felt like I could, uh, see a, a bigger portion of the, of the, of the, of the space that we're trying to achieve. And, and it just felt like I could do more, um, then, then work within the confines of a large company, which just has its, which will just, it'll just move slower. It'll be more stable, but it just, it'll move slower. So um, seeking out that faster pace, I guess. Yeah. And when you look to hire salespeople, what do you look for? 
Uh, great question. So, uh, you know, hiring salespeople, I would say, is not an easy task. And I, you know, I've done well sometimes, and I've, I've missed other times. Um, when I look back at at uh, what has really done well, I think, you know, if you're selling a, a technical product, you know, the the person has to want to understand and get the salesperson has to want to understand and get really close to the product they're selling to be able to have enough credibility to, 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 to experience it and sell it. So one thing, the, 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 the salesperson has to really be geeked out about the product. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say geeked out. The, the person has to be really excited about the, the product that they're selling and, and see its potential um, as opposed to like, Hey, this is, this is a widget that I'm selling today. I, I found that if I can find someone that really under, you know, is critical to that, understands that technology and, and likes it and wants to tinker with it, it means that they're going to be more curious about how the client would use that widget and, and, and how they would, you know, use it to, to, to further their, their, their goals. So by being curious about it themselves, they're going to be curious about how someone else is using it. And I think that curiosity um, in my experience is kind of what drives some of the opportunity because, you know, if you're, not curious. It's it's very easy to disqualify a lead um, because it doesn't like fit a particular playbook. But if you're curious, you could actually have this a conversation that opens up other other unexpected areas of conversation. And now all of a sudden you have like okay, like maybe it's a twenty percent fit here and then an eighty percent fit here, and before you know it, you've got enough of a fit across a few different use cases that like okay, now it makes sense. Um, but if you're looking for like that, you know, uh, square peg or round hole, round peg, round hole, uh, qualification, you know, it may not be immediately obvious. So, uh, curiosity and, and then finally, I I think the, the one thing that I've seen is, is consistency and just the ability, the energy to kind of keep on doing it day in, day out, um, you know, sales is has a lot of aspects to it that are um, rote. You have to, you know, have to keep on doing certain things um, to make sure you're you're there when the opportunity presents itself. And you know, there are tools to help that out with, but it's still like you have to put the effort in. You can't, you know, assume that you're going to get the the outcome without the effort. So those are the two, not the two things, but the few things that I that I'm looking at for a salesperson. Because a lot of managers wouldn't put that up very high. They put the curiosity, but not the passion about the product. Because they think, oh, there's a sales engineer for that. But I I, I tend to agree with you, especially in the startup phase. Well, that's a great question. It's a great point. So I think when I was in, you know, some, some organizations have a really great support structure of subject matter experts. And then, you know, you could argue that you have the salesperson has, takes more of a, the relationship role and then pulls in the right resource when you have them. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, at, at, at earlier in my career at, at Oracle, we had sales. I was, that's where I started. I was a sales engineer. Um, and at HubSpot, I ran the sales engineering organization. Um, but we were always trying to find what the right ratio was. So, like, in small business, we were running, like, 20 sales reps to one sales engineer uh, or, you know, in enterprise space at HubSpot, we were running like five to one. So we, we were trying to always run very lean on sales engineering. Um, and as a result, maybe this is, maybe this is uh, a cause and effect situation, but as a result, you know, I'm looking for a salesperson to carry on more of that conversation. Because I think if you can't, what are you really doing? Certainly at the startup phase, if they know what it does, like people know what HubSpot does. Right. Okay. But the person who buying it wants to know, how's it different than the 500 other ways of solving that problem? Mm -hmm. And if the salesperson doesn't know that, other than reading something or scheduling a meeting to show you. Right. Yeah, that, that's exactly how I feel about that. I've come to that conclusion myself. So in this new role, Next at 3D, I'm building out the sales team. And you know, I would like to sit, have them sit lower in the funnel um, 
and have a lot of great proof points on the product marketing side and you know let the let the client customer uh, absorb all that information and then when they do get in front of a salesperson the salesperson can then take that even further you know if all they can do is like you know point back to the documents that they've already read then you know there that's 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 not that's something that's could be a uh, an automated aspect in the future. So the, the rep has to really start to, to be a sharp implement um, when it comes to that practice. So that's how I'm thinking about it. Yeah, because that's what I always thought was one of my competitive advantages was that I could talk to the engineers. Mm-hmm. I could hold a lot of meetings by myself mm-hmm. and have it be, technical but not bitsy bitesy just kind of comparing what the issues and implications are and when i saw other reps who could really just introduce the sales engineer and then mm-hmm. close for the next step at the end of the meeting mm-hmm. i didn't find much value there unless it was a big deal well along they already are going to buy something whether it's right. you or someone else yeah, I, I think that also is sort of like the arc of a, of a salesperson in the beginning, maybe they need more of that support. And then when you're well versed in your product, and you become that subject matter expert, then you're almost bringing in the sales engineer in strategically to be another persona in your deal, you know, or someone that, you know, a lot of times, I've been on many calls where like the rep says, you know, I said the exact same thing the sales engineer said, but because the sales engineer said it, the client believed it. <laughs> so yeah. there's some well, like positional stuff too there that, you know, is, is just happens to be, you know, unfortunately like that, that was the case in some of these situations. Yeah. And on the bad side, you, you go into the four legged sales call and the smart people go, okay, so who's the salesperson? Because they don't want to listen to that person. And you know, because I tried to do, I, I did do the presentation about the technology and I'd have the sales engineer to back me up and, and give the deep dive demo. Mm-hmm. But I didn't, I wanted them to have some level of confidence that I knew the market. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, especially today where, you know, we've got the, the SDR AE model and everyone's pitch, 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 pitch. And they, everyone thinks, that it's you're in a certain state. We say these things. It's robotic versus interpersonal. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't know if you're going to bring up the BDR thing. Um, so uh, I'm struggling personally with the BDR role um, and where it fits into the process. I'm not, you know, I, I've 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 seen a bunch of different flavors of it and. You know, I've also been on the receiving end of the BDR where the BDR gets me on a meeting and then the BDR vanishes into the thin air and then someone else shows up on the call. Let's like, start it all over again. Tell <laughs> me about yourself. <laughs> and so I think that this, you know, this, 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 the BDR role is tough. I've also seen BDR roles that kind of get co-opted to become assistants of AEs. And I've also seen the other one where the, the, the BDR starts to get really good at selling. And then the AE says, well, don't sell so much because it don't, t- don't, don't get so far down the funnel. Cause then I don't have any value, uh, which is probably a signal that the, that BDR should be an AE. Yeah. Um, but there's that, that, that handoff process, I think still, we still need to work on as a, as an industry and as a profession. And I'm sure you've met a lot of great salespeople. What were the distinctions between the very best and kind of that middle pack. Sure. Uh, well, I think the, 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 the one that stands out to me um, the, the most, I think, is, is, is people who are, are just constant question askers and, and curious and also, you know, just, just want to have as many conversations as possible and learn as much. And then they're able to take link one conversation with one individual, maybe over here, and then link that to the other person over here. And like they, 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 they give themselves credibility in doing that. I've seen that really successfully done by a sales rep in the government space where, you know, he would take one, you know, these, these conversations take a long time to develop because the industry moves slow, but, you know, by conversation by conversation, he's able to kind of put together a whole picture of how this is 
uh, changing the dynamic in, in the, in the government space. Um, but it, it took a long time and it took like linking, com- like having many conversations, uh, asking extra questions and then linking what he learned into the next thing. Um, so that was, that was one of the things that was the most successful, um, and then the other one, you know, I've seen very successful people uh, have just have a, a big motor, just be able to, you know, when when someone else, you know, when that when that email comes in or that lead comes in, you know, do you wait to to, to respond to it t- tomorrow, or do you you know send a quick email now saying, hey, I got your email, thanks for you know thanks for inquiring, you know, I'm I'm. Right now, I'm, I'm, it's overtime, but I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And just kind of keeping that customer excited and keeping that person's expectation going, so that there's no like drop off of that. They're, they're nurturing that person all the way to the very end and not letting any kind of like drop off happen. So those are the the two traits that I've seen that have been really successful. And on the curiosity side, do you think it's something that's teachable, or is it either there or it's not there? Uh, great question. I, I so I, I think that uh, I, I've used the term before: functional curiosity. Um, <laughs> Which, the sense that, as opposed the to sense, dysfunctional. <laughs> no, 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 no. As opposed to just innate curiosity, because I, I think that um, you know the salesperson also has an objective and a goal that they're trying to achieve. So I guess there comes a point of there's a, comes an inflection point where curiosity actually, as a salesperson, can slow you down if you know you're just super curious then you're you're on the phone call for two hours with the client and you know you learned a lot but you're not not not, not, not right right so there has to be some like limit to the curiosity so i've called that like functional curiosity curiosity enough enough to know where that where 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 you're shaping that conversation and how you're going to use it for the to achieve your objective um so i think that aspect is probably has to be taught, you know, um, like you, you want to be curious to an extent, but you don't want it to derail your entire sales process across all of your leads and sit and opportunities. Because I think a lot of people look at it as weakness versus a strength, <clears throat> meaning I know what they want. Well, how do you know what they want? As opposed to I'm, I'm curious. I need to learn. What am I missing in my deal? Why are they going to buy? Why now? Why for me? What is going to happen next? I think too many people look at it as that. That's a weakness. I, I'm all knowing, all seeing. Almost arrogant in a, in a way. Uh, yeah, I, I, see, I see your point. I think that... Um... Well, those, yeah, those questions you're asking are, I would say like, you know, in some degree kind of functional curiosity questions to make sure like, you know, uh, how much more resource you want to expend on this, 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 this opportunity, you know, and you know, there's some, as they commit more, you want to, you want to commit more yourself. So I guess there's those questions are, I think, you know, are helping you almost as a, a, uh, a way to organize and time manage your schedule and how much effort you're going to put into someone, I think is, and that's important too, because, you know, it's, it, there's the rest of the, the job, um, which is making sure that you're, you're pulling a full funnel through. Um, my current role, I'm, I'm the hit, you know, running a desktop printer organization. I, I ran another desktop printer organization before, and you're talking sub $10,000 deal sizes. So like, you know, to get your quota, you're talking. You need to close thirty to thirty deals a month, and you need to probably be have, juggling fifty to sixty deals a month. So you, you really have to like like that curiosity and and prioritization is really important. Well, in your sale, I got to imagine that there's a big difference between them buying it as a toy to play with, or them buying it as something that's going to get them further in their career. Because it's not just a desktop printer; it's a three D printer, right? Mm-hmm. Very different. It's not you're not printing out resumes and reports and stuff. Right it's it's not a com, it's not a commodity tool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it it does 
it's 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 still in that infancy where it, it's it's providing you know actual leverage to the business if, if done properly. Um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a there'll, there's definitely a future for us where these things become you know so built into the workflow that they're they're more commoditized and you just push a button and things happen. Um, but right now, it's it's really a, a business leverage tool. And what? What would you consider your superpower as a salesperson? If there was one skill that you, you really, yeah, I got this one. I may not have others, but I've got this one. Oh, geez. Uh, well, you didn't ask me that question in the prep. So let me, let me, let me, <laughs> maybe you saved it for last. Um, for me, I, I think, you know, and not to be cliche about this, but I think drawing back on um, my, my engineering background, I, I think that um, product and market trends, uh, as well as understanding like how something in the product is going to actually net itself out in in the in the actual benefit for the client, I I I, I would like to say that that might be a superpower I have in the sense that I can kind of see very easily how uh, a, a certain aspect. Or, or gap or deficiency in, in a product of the market can be filled with something. And, um, you know, luckily if I can work closely with the engineering team, and I think that's part of why smaller teams, smaller companies benefit myself is that I can get what, you know, very intimate with the engineering team and being able to say like, Hey, here's how this is going to impact the, you know, the, the actual selling of this aspect of this printer. Like here's the technical definition. And, but, but, Boiling it down, like it's going to mean we can have this much more addressable opportunity, and I, I you know, I, I think that um, engineering itself may not just like see it from that lens, and they need to be shown that. So that's yeah. that's my super superpower, and that's a great one because engineering tends to build what's fun to build because that's why or, they're engineering <laughs> or, or never finish it because they're trying to create this perfect new one with yeah. well, a new one or the, or the perfect article. And uh, you know, it's, it, I've heard, you know, I've heard some, some folks say, okay, it's gotta be 10 X better. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe not 10 X better. <laughs> Two or three would cut it. <laughs> yeah. Just enough to differentiate. And, and uh, you know, I, yeah, there's definitely that, that push and pull. Cool. Hey, appreciate your time today, Michael. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Great. So obviously I'm, I'm on LinkedIn under Michael Curry um, and the company is Nexa 3D. And just to plug that real quickly here. So we are, we are, we just launched a new desktop business unit. And so, you know, we're looking to spin up a customer team here in North America, which includes both sales and services. And so what I'm really trying to do is break down as many silos as I can in the customer team and almost kind of create like a pod like atmosphere, uh, and the idea of selling from experience and selling from, from curiosity. And you need to know both sides, not just the pre-sale. You need to know the post-sale. And how do you have a team that that is fluent in both those dialogues? Um, and that's what I'll be doing over the next months to years. <laughs>